Hi everyone, my name is Kristen Brown. I am the Marketing and Events Manager for the Ironside Group. I wanted to take a minute and thank you all for joining today's webinar on the next step towards um, maintenance and quality excellence. I'm going to pass it over to Mike McCarran, who is the Director of Big Data and Analytics for the Ironside Group. Thank you, Kristen. As Kristen mentioned, today we're going to introduce everyone to IBM Predictive Maintenance and Quality, or PMQ for short. To all the people listening to this webinar, we are pleased that you could join us today. Just a little bit about the Ironside Group before we get started with PMQ. The Ironside Group are full-service IBM business analytic experts. Within our core services, we have you covered everywhere from information management strategy and road mapping to big data and data warehousing, to data mining and statistical modeling, to dashboards, reports, and advanced visualizations, and on to performance management and decision management. Pretty much everything you can think of under the umbrella of business analytics. We have deep technology expert across the expertise across the entire IBM business analytics and information management software portfolios. And we bring a unique blend of technical skills along with applied industry experience and knowledge. We play many roles for our customers, including business analysts, solution architects, development, and enablement. We also provide training across the entire IBM business analytics stack. We're a managed services provider, and we offer both cloud and on-premise software as service solutions. We have regional offices across the eastern United States and service our global customers wherever they operate, both in the U.S. and abroad. We've been a premier partner with IBM Cogno since 1999. We were also recently recognized by IBM. IBM named the Ironside Group the Business Analytics North American Business Partner Excellence Award winner for 2013. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter and continue the conversation, you can find me on Twitter at Mike Pitcairn. I've also included my Ironside email account as well as my LinkedIn profile. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my domain area is Big Dating Analytics. I've worked a number of years in business analytics, and I like to think that I specialize in bringing high-value business analytics solutions to our customers. I'm very pleased to be presenting to you today a high-value business analytics solution, IBM's predictive maintenance and quality. I'm very excited to be joined by Rick Durham and Anush Marfatia of IBM. Rick Durham is on the IBM Predictive Analytics channel team, and Rick will be giving the IBM Preventive Maintenance and Quality demonstration. Anush Marfatia is Program Director of Solutions marketing for business analytics, focusing on PMQ. Anuj will be walking through some specific customer use cases. And all three of us will be available for Q&A, which reminds me, if you'd like to join into today's discussion, um, naturally you may enter questions into the chat window, and Kristen will act as our moderator for those questions so that we may answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation as time permits. In addition, if you tweet or you're on Twitter, please tweet us at the Ironside Group with any questions throughout or after. We will continue to monitor for questions at hashtag IBMPMQ after the conclusion of this webinar. So if you want to join in a live discussion, be sure to use that hashtag IBMPMQ. That brings us to today's agenda. What we hope to address with today's presentation and demonstration is for you to be able to answer the fundamental question, what is predictive maintenance and quality? And how have other organizations used PMQ effectively? With the hope that you will see value in PMQ for your organization. So we'll provide a couple of use cases and examples to get you thinking, and in addition, and perhaps this is the best way to understand what PMQ can do for you, is we'll have a demonstration will be provided for you today. 
Okay, so let's get started. Let's start answering the question, what is PMQ? And um, we're talking about today IBM uh, predictive maintenance and quality. And IBM predictive maintenance and quality helps you reduce your operational costs, improve asset productivity, and increase process efficiency by providing operational maintenance and quality insights directly to decision makers. PMQ is an IBM product with many features and capabilities associated with it. And let me repeat that again. PMQ is a product. And as such, and it's a, it's a, it's a total solution, and as such, it brings you an accelerated time to value. So by that I mean you can leverage easy to install, pre-configured software and content stack. You can utilize standard data source connectors, models, dashboards and reports to reduce the need for additional services. You can quickly expand through the, uh, you can quickly expand included content for specific industry and business applications unique to your organization. Among the features of PMQ are real-time capabilities. These real-time capabilities give us the uh, ability to collect, integrate, orchestrate, analyze, and report streaming information so we can conduct real-time monitoring of assets and processes. And this enables decision-making in real-time to maximize operational outcomes. Okay. So to understand and address big data, it's helpful to understand the three V's of big data, volume, variety, and veracity. Predictive and advanced analytics leverage manufacturing quality and supply chain insights and recommend actions. And these actions go from descripting, describing what's occurring, or descriptive, the predictive, and the prescriptive analytics, as well as data and text mining. We can use these advanced analytics to uncover hidden patterns and associations from sensors and programmable logical controllers, information that may be in our databases and conditional information about where the asset is being maintained, and our history of maintenance logs. And we're able to utilize menu-driven interfaces without the need for any programming to create predictive models. The next item I'd like to talk about is the quick and accurate decision making. With this, we're able to utilize the decision management methodology and optimize decisions at the point of impact, balancing resources and cost constraints. We can combine asset and process business roles of the, of the organization to enhance our decisions. And we can conduct what-if simulations to accommodate changing operational conditions. Maximo integration. PMQ integrates with the leading enterprise asset management system, Maximo. This gives us access to our historical maintenance records as also being able to send some of our decision-making abilities into Maximo for the next uh, best action to take place. In the business intelligence realm, with inside of PMQ, their self-serve query reporting and analysis from virtually any of the data sources that are within PMQ. You can leverage the drag and drop dashboard environment and provide real time views. And you can experience insight wherever needed with mobile capabilities. Okay, so let's take a look at how this works as a streamlined system or a streamlined approach. Uh, reducing maintenance and warranty costs while improving product quality starts with that streamlined approach. And predictive maintenance and quality analyzes data from multiple sources and provides recommended actions enabling informed decisions. Monitor, maintain, and optimize assets for beta, better availability, utilization, and performance means you can use it to help gain better visibility into the assets via the real-time monitoring mobile decision management, and all the predictive capabilities. You can get help in predicting asset failure so you can work toward optimizing quality 
and supply chain processes. You can use it as one of your tools to help predict asset or part failure. By extending predictive analytics from the asset to its extended processes, processes such as quality or inventory, you can provide insights for both assets and processes. So this removes the guesswork from decision-making processes. You can optimize decision within the resource constraints by visualizing issues and helping to enable quick and accurate execution of recommended actions, which all add to the key goal of maximizing outcomes for the organization. So let's take a look at this, at the architecture that underlies PMQ. So I'd like to start with the analytic data store. Master data, such as the list of devices and the types of measurements they produce, is located into the analytic data store. The device events are also stored in the data store. The information in the analytic data store is then used to perform predictive scoring, a process that uses a mathematical models and puts a numeric value on the likelihood that a device or a component failure will occur. These predictive scores are then passed to decision management which uses a predefined set of roles to determine the appropriate actions to take in response to various scores. For example, if a score indicates that the probability of a transformer failure is less than 0.7, the roles might call for no immediate action. If the score rises above 0.8, the roles might trigger a request to have a physical inspection performed. This request can be in the form of a work order created and an external such them, such as IBM Maximo Asset Management. The scores and decision management actions are also recorded in the analytic data store as internally generated events can be aggregated in the same way as external events from devices. The invoice in the, or excuse me, the information in the analytic data store is viewable in IBM BI reports. These reports can be used to view the data such as KPIs and to value or, or to have value, profile values for a particular device over time. So let's take a deeper dive into the predictive analytics itself. And what we're working toward is going from time-based maintenance to condition-based maintenance. And typically there's a predefined lifetime for replacement. This can sometimes lead to unexpected failures and the associated frustrations with that. What we'd like to do is, or wanting to do, is to move to a condition-based maintenance that raises alerts based on the actual conditions taking place. So uh, to do this, we have the modeling capabilities to do, uh, to look at the patterns in our data and detect how to classify present condition into good or bad. And as these change points occur, be recognized in the system so we can take the appropriate actions along the way. Now I'd like to speak to you about some PMQ predictive maintenance and quality use cases. In predictive maintenance and quality, we're able to provide forward visibility into the equipment, processes, and quality performance issues. We're able to understand by monitoring and predicting and control process variability. We have the ability to optimize maintenance intervals and minimize the unscheduled maintenance. And we can identify incorrect operating procedures or identify improper maintenance procedures. This combination of events enables us to have in-depth root cause failure analysis and we can determine optimum corrective action procedures. This allows us to detect design issues faster and provide warranty and service prognostics. And again, the ability to analyze in fleet service reliability. I would now like to pass the microphone over to Anuj Marfadia as Anuj walks us through some variations of, of predictive maintenance use cases. Thanks a lot, Mike. 
So one important aspect to note about um, the underlying technology is the fact that it can be utilized within various different industries. And actually, as we built out this specific product, we did take into consideration the best practices from these different industries, um, everything from mining to healthcare to um, consumer products, uh, washers, dryers. Uh, vending machines to uh, planes, trains, and automobiles, and uh, helicopters, uh, you name it. Uh, the underlying theme behind all of this is the fact that these are all physical assets that are gathering and capturing a lot of data. Uh, and historically speaking, many organizations, uh, even today, are trying to determine what do I do with that data. Now, a lot of times when we talk to clients, they end up uh, either residing in some sort of database or, or warehouse somewhere, or they just end up getting uh, deleted uh, because it is very difficult to garner some sort of insights from all these different data sources that are coming in, uh, both streaming and at rest. But now we've got the technology to be able to not only deal with that data, but be able to align that, orchestrate it, analyze that, and ultimately provide those decisions, those optimized decisions, to the ultimate decision maker. And so when you're talking about some of these various types of uh, industries and examples, uh, a couple of them, and we'll talk about some more later on in this discussion, uh, but just to kind of kick things off. Uh, so we worked with Coca-Cola, and with them specifically, um, what we had done is we worked with their uh, vending machines. And if you've noticed in McDonald's and a lot of other restaurants, they are what's called freestyle machines, whereby you can uh, essentially choose from anywhere from uh, 20, 30, 50 different options uh, within the Coca-Cola brand, uh, and you can mix and match your specific drink. So now you can essentially mix uh, Coke vanilla with Diet Coke, with Cherry Coke, all in one drink, and it's been very popular, uh, not only for uh, the individuals, the consumers, uh, but also obviously for Coca-Cola themselves. So one of the problems that they were having is depending upon the type of combinations within that specific drink, uh, they were getting failures regarding um, their specific uh, lines and hoses on the back end of that freestyle machine uh, within the connector points. And ultimately, it came down to each different flavor has a specific chemical composition. And each of those specific chemical compositions has a specific wear rate on the components that it's flowing through. And so they always had to call in a repair person or a maintenance person that was essentially hired 24-7 or had, had it within their service agreements uh, that they were paying uh, a lot of money for. And what they were able to utilize is utilize the predictive maintenance and, and quality uh, technologies that we've been talking about today to uh, predict what are those combinations that lead to likely failure. Um, what are uh, the probability levels at certain times of day, certain types of conditions, certain types of um, specific syrups and drinks. Um, that led to failure, so now they can proactively uh, be ahead of the curve, proactively be able to say, you know what, I'm going to plan my resources, my maintenance resources accordingly um, before there actually is a failure. Um, and in this point, it, there's a failure in the consumer standpoint. So now all of a sudden, this failure that occurs at the freestyle machine, you've got unhappy customers at these various retail locations, um, and that ultimately does not look good, not only from a brand image standpoint, but fundamentally from a revenue standpoint as well. Uh, and that's just one example. Another example just showing from the from the pictures here, we worked with a car manufacturer, BMW, and one of the problems that they, was ha they were having was with their engine blocks. What they were finding out is they went through the manufacturing process of engine blocks there would be small little cracks that were not found, not detected, uh, but would eventually be detected later on down the line at the end of the assembly line or even when it got out um, into the dealerships and people were actually driving them, causing issues. And so for them, this was a big uh, issue, not only from a quality standpoint uh, but, and from a PR standpoint, but from a cost standpoint as well, because these were all uh, warranty issues, warranty returns that they had to replace. As they went through the process and tried to determine you know, the root cause of it, what they found out was, hey, look, they already had and captured a lot of data around the process. And fundamentally, the process was being able to take this liquid metal, pour it into a mold. Uh, the mold would be going into a cooling chamber. And about eight or 10 hours later, you would get uh, the specific engine block shape uh, that you wanted for the specific vehicle. Now, the problem here is if there is a way that they could somehow determine what is the likelihood of failure before it went through this eight or 10 hour cha cooling chamber that would help them 
much more, not only from a time perspective, but also from a cost perspective as well. And um, that's exactly what they did. They utilized the technologies here to predict uh, when were those specific conditions that led to high failure rates. And this is not only information that was existing within their databases, information they already were collecting, information such as um, cooling chamber uh, temperatures and, and humidity and the rate that the engine block was moving on the conveyor belt, uh, but also um, temperatures surrounding that specific uh, manufacturing line and, and assets in general, taking into consideration the humidity is around it, taking into consideration who the operator is, all of that coming together, um, utilizing technology to predict that at certain times of the day, there were higher failure rates than other. And not only that, but it's not only certain times of the day, but also certain humidity points. And so as this information was presented to the, the manufacturing manager who was working on the line and trying to figure out the root cause, he had an aha moment and, and quickly snapped his fingers and said, I know exactly what's going on. And they went toward that manufacturing line. And they, they noticed that this manufacturing line was under a window. And during this afternoon time frame where there happened to be a lot of defects, it was because of the fact that there's actually sunlight coming through the window hitting the liquid mold, the, the liquid metal, that was affecting the chemical composition of ultimately the engine block and the mold. And their solution to that, which was to put a shade. Obviously not very costly, um, but it solved the problem. Now, the technology itself uh, within predictive maintenance and quality didn't tell them to put a shade, but it did help them from a root cause perspective to determine what are those conditions and those criteria that led to that failure. And as a previous quality engineer myself, I can tell you, going through that root cause process can take anywhere from days, weeks, and even months. Because what they did as an organization is they would shut the line down specifically, they would move the product over to another line, which was an older process, and they would start working and going through the root cause process to try to determine the problem by breaking down the line and then putting it back together. This obviously took a lot of time for them, a lot of resources, uh, and then just the dollar around, amounts around cost that just kept increasing and increasing. And so this is just an example of how um, utilizing technology helped them out. They were able to save and reduce scrap rates by 80% uh, within uh, a four-month time frame that was measured. And it really drastically gave them a, a lot of savings on the bottom end. And ultimately, um, obviously from a consumer standpoint, reduced their warranties and improved customer satisfaction. So these are just two examples, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some more examples later on in the discussion, but at this point I'd like to hand it off to Ricky, who's going to walk through a demo. So here's, uh, we're going to talk about PMQ and, and do a demo here. I want to set up the background of kind of uh, this problem that the PMQ is, is set up to solve. In this particular scenario, what we're looking at is we have a drill operator who's running a, a drill machine and uh, drilling into a rock surface. We're at 1132 on a Wednesday. And what we see is that we're measuring, taking sensor samples off of this uh, drill, and it's the, uh, the revolutions per minute are 7320. Uh, the extension of the drill is 4.8 meters. The attack angle is 87 degrees. The tip temperature is 178 degrees C. Uh, we're grabbing some ambient temperature uh, measurements, so we know the outside temperature, the precipitation, the humidity, and uh, the wind measurements. And what we're doing is we're bringing this data in, and uh, we're, we're grabbing the min, the max, the average, and the last readings for this. And so we're taking these sensor readings from, all, from these measurements. We're presenting those to a predictive model, and we're calculating uh, a health score for that. So just a basic one number that we can use to look at this drill uh, machine and, and indicate it's the health of, of, of the asset. At, at, a separate, at 1133, we move one minute further in time. We see that our measurements changed, and we, again, we take these the sensor measurements, we present those to the predictive model, and we calculate a new health score. Later on in the day, at, at uh, almost 4 o'clock, we've done the same process every minute. That is, reading the sensors, calculating this health score, and we see that our health score is now down around 50. Essentially what this is is that uh, we now know that this drill machine is on the hairy edge of failure. So this is the, the PMQ process. Of, of basically grabbing sensor data, presenting to the model, um, and calculating a health score. So we take that health score, and at this point in time, we present that to ADM, 
And what we're doing is we're, we're taking the health score along with a lifetime asset value, and we're going to see a little bit of this in the, as we go through the demo here. We're presenting it to ADM, and we're optimizing that, and essentially we're recommending to do a flush on this piece of equipment. So let's take a, a quick look at uh, the process of what PM, how PMQ really works under the covers. So uh, PMQ uh, ships with a dashboard, a set of dashboards that look like the following. So what a manufacturer or, or a company that's monitoring process one may have uh, may have dozens, if not hundreds, of locations. May have uh, literally thousands of machines. So what's important is to be able to look at any location and identify, you know, which assets are really having the most problems. In this case, we can see drill machine 11, uh, just from the urgent responses that are being sent, is having the most problems. So we click on drill machine 11. We see that the health score, uh, which is indicated on the y-axis here, we see that that's oscillating around that 0.5 value, right, throughout the day. And, and the, and the x-axis here is showing us the hours through the day. So we get an idea of this machine's basically um, are oscillating between being weak or anemic to, to possible failures. Uh, well, another way that we can look at uh, the same type of data uh, with PMQ is to uh, look at a report like this, which would show us the, uh, you know, it would actually show us looking at the actual sensor readings that are coming in that are contributing to that health score. So when we look at ambient temperature, for example, here we have the, the lower and the upper control limit, and we see that, um, you know, the last value here is 27.95, and that exceeds the upper control limit. So just in a glance, we can get an idea of, you know, what sensor readings are contributing to the failure of this piece of equipment. Uh, we can look at the same type of data from an XBAR R chart in many, many other ways. Uh, one of the ways that we can look at that data also is simply to uh, look at the data from the standpoint of over time how what has happened to this asset. So here in this middle graph, what we're looking at is we're seeing that uh, for that drill machine 11, that over time, over the month of July in 2013, you know, it was gradually degrading in terms of its performance until it, you know, uh, reached below a, a 40 on the health score. If we took another uh, example here, if we look at drill machine two, we see that it's also starting to degrade. And if we put, drill down on any of these data points, we can go down and see uh, the actual uh, what's happening with that asset. So here we're looking at, let me blow this up a bit. Uh, here we're looking at this drill machine. We're looking at its health score. And we see that the health score uh, for the drill machine has actually gone below the lower control limit. Comes back in and goes back down, oscillating. If we drill into this, we see that um, that at the point at which it's dropped below uh, the, the you know lower control limit, we see that an urgent inspection, that is to create a, a, a form of flush, has been generated. And this would be an example where automatically PMQ would look at that health score, um, send uh, create that work order, for example, through Maximo, and a person would be dispatched out to to um, you know, do the urgent inspection and perform a flush on that piece of equipment. If we look at what happened as soon as the machine come back, comes back into um, you know, between its upper and lower control limits, we see that the next point in time, the only thing that, that needs to happen is it just needs to be monitored. So when we look at how does PMQ do this inside, you know, what, what, how does that work? Um, this, in the center of it is, is the predictive analytics component. We, we gather data from the equipment. We have equipment data. We have measurements that are taken off the sensors. We have maintenance data. And then we have failure data. If we were to look at those things combined together, what we would see is um, this, this type of information. And again, we saw these on the pictorials. We have the ambient temperature, attack angle, extension, fluid supplier. Uh, we have that tip temperature. And uh, we also know if the, the piece of equipment has failed in the past the days since it was last maintained and the days uh, since it's, it's last failed. We take that data, and what we do with that data is, first of all, we get an idea of how many failures have we had historically against our total nine failures. So we can very quickly run a quick chart, and we can see that you know about five percent of our assets have failed within the period of time that we've been um, you know pulling in this data. What we really want to know is this: we want to get an idea of What's causing failures of poor equipment, right? PMQ is good at telling us those kind of things. So we can create some models that essentially let us look at, at uh, you know, what's going on with a uh, particular um, unit. And so we see here that when we look at, and this is just a simple rules model, 
But for this, when we look at the failures that occur, we can see that, for example, uh, when the humidity for this drill uh, goes below, above 74.151, and the day since the last time it failed is greater than 15, you know, there's an 81.82% uh, probability that it's going to fail. So, you know, again, with simple rules, we can start understanding what are the, what are the causes of, you know, failures occurring uh, with an asset. We can take that data, um, and we can actually go a little bit farther. We can, we can zoom in here, and we can visually get an idea of looking at those failures against the, um, the actual, you know, the root causes uh, against the number of fails. So, for example, let's take a look at torque. When we look at torque, we can see that if the drill uh, is not have enough torque, that is, it's a very low torque rating, we see that we have a number of failures, a higher number of failures. As we move up uh, uh, and increase the torque, the twisting force, we start seeing failures rise again. What PMQ is essentially doing, and, and we see the same kind of thing, for example, if we look at the temp temperature. As temp temperature is too low, we have failures. As temp temperature starts rising, we start seeing more and more failures. So PM2 essentially is able to pull the, all of this sensor information together and determine overall if failures are going to occur. We can, we, from that, we create a predictive model. And that's what this is here, this nugget uh, in, in the PM2. So when we run, uh, when we create a table of that, we can take a look at, at this information and see that this was the same information that we brought in um, before, right, the ambient temperature attack angle. And what we're essentially doing in the predictive side of PMQ is we're, we're, we're making a prediction whether this piece of equipment is going to fail or not. And we indicate that with a 1 or a 0. And we also create a confidence for that, for that value. So in this particular case, we're, for this particular asset, we're predicting that it will not fail with a 94.1% um, confidence. Uh, value. We calculate a health score, and essentially what we're doing is simply coming up with a score uh, from those models to make a statement regarding how healthy the piece of equipment is, the asset, and against failures. And when we plot that, uh, this will give you an idea of what we receive with our health, the health score that we generate. So we see that whenever uh, we do, when our health score is is high, we tend to have fewer failures, with the red indicating a failure uh, level. As, as the health score drops, though, we see that we have increasing uh, numbers of fails occur. And we can validate that same idea by looking at fail over time. So I realize this is a very busy chart, but I want to give you an idea of, of, of how what we've done. Each one of the, the, the numbers here, 62, 63, 64, 65, these are all assets or machines that we have out in the field, real machines that we have. And across several dates, we have been running machines and, and calculating a health score for, for those. That health score um, uh, is indicated you know, by the y-axis here, right? And where we see a, a red dot in, in, in every one of these panels, that indicates that we had a failure. And we can see in general, after we get below about 40, uh, we start seeing more and more failures across all the machines. So essentially, this tells us our calculation of health score is pretty good, just from a visual perspective. What we do is, in PMQ, we calculate two things that we need. We calculate the health score, and we calculate a lifetime um, uh, analysis value. So to predict how long, not only uh, what is the health of the machine, but how long will the machine or the asset last. We bring those two pieces of information in into uh, what is called ADM, or Analytic Decision Management. And ADM uh, allows us to take essentially that, that information, that health score, those sensor values, that lifetime analysis, add it to our business rules, and to optimize decisions. So here is, uh, to give a preview, here is the same data that we were just looking at uh, that was in, uh, in, in, in uh, Modeler. And what we see is we have our asset IDs, and we have uh, all the same information, our ambient temperatures, our extension length. And, and we've added to this a health score and also the expected lifetime. So what we do with that data is a couple of things. One of the things that we do with it is we establish some uh, criteria of what are the kind of actions that we need to take. For example, in this scenario with the drill machine, I may want to do an urgent inspection. I may need to monitor the machine or it may be within limits and I don't have to do anything. 
And, and we combined uh, the, the previous scores that we created uh, in a way that we put some business rules around them. So we say, you know, if our health score is below 35 or equal to 35, we're going to do an urgent inspection. If our uh, expected device lifetime is less than or equal to 20, we need to do an urgent inspection. Otherwise, if we're between these values, right, for the health score and the expected lifetime, we just need to monitor the asset. Otherwise, we just, it's within limits. We don't really need to do anything. One of the important aspects of PN2 is this. We're creating a system whereby we can automatically generate work orders directly out to the people who service equipment, and we don't have to have a maintenance supervisor looking at a dashboard and picking up the phone to call them. This, this whole process is an automated process. And from here, what uh, we can do is we can take and we can run a simulation. We can get an idea if, that, if we were to use these um, predictive models that we've created, well, along with the business rules that we have here, how, how, could we figure out a way to figure out how many people that we're going to need in the operation? So we can simulate. We run the simulation, what we're going to see is we're going to get an idea of uh, the, the level of resources that it's going to take to support this group of assets. So what we see here in terms of recommendation is we see the number of, for example, we have 72 urgent inspections we're going to have to perform, and we're going to need to monitor, just simply have somebody monitoring 322 of the assets. Just, and we can take that. We can take this and divide it into the amount of time that it takes to do an urgent inspection or monitoring, and we can figure out the resources that we need in order to support those assets or those machines. The other thing that we can do, and this is probably the most important uh, aspect of, of PMQ and, and analytic decision management, is we can calculate, um, we can figure out the prioritization uh, and, and optimization of our assets. So we can take the previous information we had, that is the business rules, the health score model information that we got, lifetime asset model, and we can send it into an optimization engine. In this case, what we're basically doing is saying, I'm going to take that. I have three things that I could do, an urgent inspection, I could do monitoring, or I could work. I could just simply do it in limits. I know that if, if I have to do an urgent inspection, um, if, if the machine goes down, it's going to cost me $10,000, right? Uh, per unit time while it's down. It's going to cost me $1,000 uh, to go and do an urgent inspection on that. So I take all of these constraints along with the, the health score information that we had, the uh, lifetime analysis. I present all of the records that we pulled in, and I use this prioritization equation to optimize basically uh, the overall um, value of, of you know this entire operation. So I do a what-if analysis on it. What I see is the following. I see that if I use, well, set up the business rules that we said, uh, use the, uh, the, you know, the, the health scores against those in the lifetime uh, asset uh, analysis uh, with that, I can expect to a, a, a save about $712,000 roughly over the unit time for, for, for these assets. If I go back and change the business rules, um, this value will change. So essentially what happens in ADM is, we're optimizing the cost of running our equipment based upon uh, the business rules and the thresholds that we set. And obviously, this is a place where engineering and finance work together you know, to, uh, to optimize the overall organization. But in doing so, uh, PM2 is addressing a number of things. It's, it's letting us look at uh, the information from a dashboard perspective and know what's going on in the organization. It's creating the predictive models to predict when things are going to fail, and it's allowing us to optimize the overall operation. Thank you for that demonstration, Rick. That was a very nice job, and I appreciate your taking the time and showing us through that example. I think there's a, a tremendous amount of power underneath the sheets of PMQ that that uh, demonstration highlights. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn this back over to Anuj. Thanks a lot uh, for the demo there. Um, let's talk about a couple of other examples, uh, one being the Israel Electric uh, Corporation. Uh, so they were um, having a big problem being the sole energy provider of the country of Israel, uh, being able to meet their, the needs and the demands of their constituents, their citizens, their, their government. But the problem that they were having is they had a fixed number of assets being turbines. Um, they were various types of turbines, uh, uh, gas, hydro, et cetera. They were generating this electricity via, um, but uh, primarily they were gas turbines. And the problem that they were having is these turbines were failing. 
And because of these uh, failure uh, rates for their turbines, uh, that would affect the electricity generation and the output to the people. And so they would end up having a lot of brownouts and blackouts and essentially uh, aspects that were similar to if you lived in the New York area a couple of years ago, similar to that. Um, it was very much unplanned. They couldn't really do anything about it, and they were reactive as an organization. So when there was a problem, then you would send out the maintenance resources, go check out the turbine, um, see what they could do, um, and go through the usual kind of root cause analysis and, and work through that. What they did do um, was that they were gathering a lot of information, and a lot of it happened to be sensor and streaming information. And so we utilize the technology that we've been talking about here today uh, to fundamentally be able to predict when this uh, downtime was going to occur, when there was going to be a failure within the turbine, uh, which would affect their consumers. And so out of the box, their usual, I'll say, kind of prediction was 30 minutes before failure. They were able to do that without with just existing technologies that they had. Now, you can imagine 30 minutes doesn't really give you that much time to do anything. Uh, so 30 minutes before failure, they knew about it, and it was uh, essentially reactive. But now with this technology, uh, they were able to uh, find out about the failure 30 hours before the actual event occurred, uh, allowing them to align the resources, allowing them to align you know, their, their spare parts that were needed for the turbine, uh, allowing them to inform their consumers of potential issues that are upcoming, um, all of that. Um, all because of the fact that they were able to utilize the technology here. And you can see some of the cost reduction uh, savings here, cost reduction by 20%, savings of over 80000 per specific turbine. And for them specifically, they had 12, 15 different turbines. And so you're talking about uh, in the million-dollar range uh, easily regarding just uh, pure uh, savings on specifically uh, oil combustion. And so this is just one example and another example of how, you know, we're talking about different types of industries and, and uses and how they've utilized this technology. This is just another example within the energy utility space um, relative to some of the other maybe automotive examples or consumer products examples or mining examples that specifically Rick uh, walked through. Another example that uh, we have is uh, within the automotive space. And this one is uh, specifically working with uh, Honda. And the problem that they were having was were specifically within their um, electric vehicles uh, and their batteries specifically. So they had issues with uh, battery failure. And uh, while and warranty rates for batteries are, are, are pretty extensive beyond just the usual three-year, 36,000 mile here in the United States. So uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to really focus on that, improve their quality, and then ultimately improve their customer satisfaction around their electric vehicles and electric batteries in general. So what they did is, and the first phase of it is essentially talked about in this slide here, uh, but what they were able to do was utilize technology to predict when batteries were going to fail um, within the car and within the manufacturing process. Um, they kind of took that information, aligned it with uh, historical warranty information, aligned it to real-time information regarding the driver and how that driver is using the vehicle, uh, what conditions was the driver utilizing it. As you are well aware of, the, the vehicle itself is a smart hub uh, of information. Uh, there's just a lot of information that a vehicle is con collecting via its ECU or electronic controls unit. And uh, what they were able to do is take that information information, uh, link it up with uh, their existing information they had in their databases, analyze that all in, all in real time, and then provide a, a, some sort of decision or output. And then their decision was ultimately being able to tell either the process engineer or the manufacturing engineer of, of what needed to get fixed on the line. Um, and ultimately, uh, what they'll be doing is actually informing the driver themselves uh, that there is a, a failure within the, the batteries that has an expectant rate that's, that's going to have an issue within an X amount of time, be it uh, minutes, hours, or days, and be able to provide them with information to the closest dealership or the closest auto shop um, so the driver uh, himself or herself can quickly uh, get it fixed uh, before it actually becomes a problem where you're uh, stuck in the middle of the road or on the side of the road. Um, so you can see how this can fundamentally and how the technology that we've been talking about as much as we talk about the importance of organizational uh, improvements from a cost standpoint or a process standpoint, ultimately this is all affecting us as individuals, as consumers, and being able to um, save our lives potentially um, is something that uh, easily cannot be quantified. And so you'll start seeing uh, these types of technologies, at least within what Honda is doing, uh, much more in our day-to-day -day lives uh, going forward here in the upcoming years. So really excited about how they're utilizing uh, the technology that we've talked about here in the discussion today. 
And so with that, what I'd like to do is, is pass it off back to Mike, who will close it off. Thank you, Anoush. That was very, those were two uh, very compelling use cases. Um, before we begin the Q&A, we wanted to present you with some additional ideas for actionable next steps. Naturally, if you have interest, the Ironside Group can arrange a PMQ presentation or demonstration for your organization similar to this one. Or perhaps a visioning workshop where you could learn more about our solutions in a hands-on type of environment. Uh, another step along the curve may be a PMQ business value assessment. Uh, we can identify areas for improved business value and quantify expected returns and prioritize those with the highest and fastest return. A solution workshop is used to lay out a path, to lay out the path ahead. And from intermediate improvements to common future vision. Uh, designed to drive out specific, a specific solution and with requirements, technology recommendations, implementation time, costs, benefits, and next steps around that solution. A proof of concept is often a, a precursor to a full implementation. Ironside Group can provide you with the necessary business analytics expertise to prove the path forward, starting small and scaling up. So at this point in our day, I'd like to uh, turn it over uh, for question and answer. And I want to ask Kristen if she's received any uh, questions during the presentation and demonstration. Yeah, so actually at this time, we'll open it up for any um questions. If you have a question, just type it into your dashboard there and it'll pop up on my screen and I will read it out loud for the group to answer. So one of the questions that came in was, do you need uh, statisticians or a very technical team to modify or maintain the solution? Uh, I'll, I'll take that, that question. Um, I think the answer to that question is, is no, you don't. In general, um, even the models that we look at uh, today, to, to be able to use, to be able to change those and to be able to do that, you, you really don't have to have on-staff statisticians to do that. Uh, we have a lot of people that, you know, we have business analysts, financial analysts, people who never used, um, done anything with the, you know, the model or product, which is kind of core to PMQ. Um, we've, we've trained them in, in, you know, basically a day or two. Uh, just on the basics of, of, of how to do that. So I, I think the answer to the, that question, and, and the other part of it is on an implementation. Uh, obviously, there's you know there is a, a shadowing and, and there's side by side training that goes along with that. And just to add to that, you know, earlier on we were talking about uh, accelerating the time to value. And so out of the box, uh, a lot of what Rick had showed you uh, regarding the reports and then the models and the dashboards, uh, et cetera, um, all of that come uh, out of the box uh, at a foundational layer. And then working with your specific uh, team there on your specific data sets, um, it gets modified, it gets tweaked. And then so when you're actually ready to go into production and you're talking about changes that may be necessary uh, in the future, um, they're just modifications to what already exists. And that's where and what Mike was talking about, where the kind of, I'll say, basic training comes into place, you know, as needed. Uh, but definitely, uh, you know, the, the expertise is essentially within the software and comes via uh, the Ironside group. Thanks, guys. Another question came in, how long has PMQ been available? So the um, technologies itself have been around for over 20, 30 years uh, easily. Uh, what we've done differently uh, this past year is when, based on a lot of the discussions that we've had with clients um, and based on where um, kind of the market is going and fundamentally based on the need of being able to bring together both data integration and data analytics capabilities um, at an agnostic level from a data standpoint, so being able to deal with any type of data. Um, that became very much a need as organizations that said, hey, look, analytics is great, but we're still having problems with you know, bringing all this data together and aligning it and integrating it, um, and we're still trying to make sure that that goes well. Uh, before we can even think about or try to utilize analytics. And so what we've done as an IBM company is really put uh, both of those aspects together um, under one product. Um, and so that one uh, product um, has been uh, available here, uh, was recently launched uh, in Q2 of last year in 2013. Uh, but the technologies that have been utilized uh, for this uh, data integration and data analytics products to come together um, have been around for over 20, 30 years. I've got one more question. What is the cost? 
So I think the cost aspect of it is really a discussion that needs to be had on depending upon the, uh, the amount of data that you have, what really is your business need. Um, all of that kind of comes in together uh, to determine the cost. It's uh, uh, not a number that uh, can be uh, determined uh, just uh, off the bat without knowing any type of kind of background information. So for that particularly, um, having that uh, discussion when Mike was talking about you know, a business value assessment or just additional conversations in general, uh, that's uh, that's where some of the, the asks and, and questions will need to come up uh, for your specific uh, ar architecture and your specific business need as well. There was actually one more question that came in. Is there a cloud offering or do I need to install or manage on site? Yeah, so currently right now it is an on-premise offering. Um, there is not a cloud offering, though those are, there are uh, discussions with it, but as of now it's uh, it's only an on-premise offering. All right, those were the last questions that came in. If anybody else has any other questions that kind of come to mind after the presentation, um, feel free to reach out to Mike, Rick, or Anuj. Thank you all for attending.